this afternoon, the best practice panel you just heard about is going to be more about what's happening now. Where are we today? Um, this talk that we're going to spend now is thinking about the future. Where are we headed? 5, 10, 20 years from now, what's going to be happening in this industry? And I think it'll be exciting. The format, we're going to go for about 30 minutes with some prepared questions. Um, so they've rehearsed, and they're going to read them verbatim, their responses, to make it really exciting. If you know, these are really great panelists, so they won't do that. Um, and I'll mix it up and throw in a few curveballs, but I'd love for there to be some questions from the audience. So I know many of you, and if, if there aren't random questions that come up, I will call on a few people to ask a question. So if, Angela, I'm looking at you. If you know <laughs> uh, that uh, I may call on you, get a question ready in your mind so we can have a good dialogue here. So let me bring up the panelists now. I want to take my seat and we'll introduce first the emerit President Emeritus. Emerita, sorry, Latin. sorry, Latin, yes, Latin. Yes. President Emerita of the Wisconsin Alumni Association, Paula Bonner. <laughs> and the current executive director of the Harvard Alumni Association, also thanking them for letting us use their facilities, Philip Lovejoy. Come on up, Philip. Thank you. A distinguished panel. We all wore our blues today. I did. So we're going to have a chat, and we're going to have some interesting questions, and they'll build to some more difficult things. But the first one is a really difficult one to start is just, just tell us about yourself. A little brief introduction. What I'd like to hear and let everybody else know is a little bit about you, your career path, and how you got to where you were and what you're doing now, maybe. Okay. Start with Paula. Thanks, Chris. And first, it's great to be here again. Um, appreciate Daniel's invitation. And I'm delighted to have the opportunity to meet Philip Lovejoy, who I haven't met before. Um, I started out uh, in a similar career area, uh, very similar as Chris, uh, starting out in um, athletics. I came to Wisconsin for graduate school. I was an undergrad physical education major. I was all about opening up opportunities for women and girls in sports, because this was uh, the early 70s. Title IX in the US uh, had just been passed. And um, that was one of my ways to give back and create social change and progress in a, in a great direction. So fortunately, I was um, named assistant athletic director just as I finished my master's. So for 13 years, I helped start the Women's Intercollegiate Athletic Program at Wisconsin. And then during that 12, 10, 11, or 12 year, I was feeling antsy. I felt like, OK, a lot of things certainly were not done. <laughs> Women's athletics is never done. Nothing's ever done. Um, and, but I wanted to work more with higher education and the university in a broader way. I wanted to really be in higher ed leadership and administration and how I could link all of this great university together. And it so ha happened that a very long-term alumni director at Wisconsin was, uh, had announced his retirement. Long story short, I don't know how many of you know Donna Shalala. Uh, she had become chancellor of our university at Wisconsin at this point, which was 1989. And um, we had named a, um, the associate executive director, had been promoted to director. And she said, Paula? I just think you ought to move over from athletics. This is Donna, you know. We're eating a hot dog in the, in the, in the <laughs> parking lot. Uh, you should come over to athletics. I mean, come over to the Alumni Association. You'll be great, and it'll be wonderful. And you just did what Donna said. And so the next thing I knew, I was over as Associate Executive uh, Director of the Wisconsin Alumni Association. And then I've had the privilege of um, working there 28 years, and in 2000, became president and CEO for 18 years. So um, long time, 41 years at Wisconsin. So that is a, a kind of an interesting um, perspective to have, working with eight chancellors. And so that's kind of where I am, and happy to talk about that more or answer more about that later. Yeah, great. Phil, tell us your story. Your crooked mile, I call it. Well, none of them are linear. <laughs> you, you went undergrad to study alumni engagement, I'm assuming. Yeah. You yeah. just no. went that path. Um, <laughs> So I've been at Harvard, well, actually, first, thank you for inviting me to be here today and, and participate in this, and welcome all of you to Harvard, um, to our Longwood campus. If you have time while you're here, I encourage you to go to Cambridge and see our, and Alston and see the other campuses. Um, I've been at Harvard for 19 years. 
my background, yeah, it was a crooked path, um, but the common thread was always marketing and public relations. Mm. Um, and I ended up at Harvard actually through the travel industry. I worked in the travel industry for six years before coming to Harvard uh, in a, working in ecotourism uh, and natural history travel. And I went to Harvard to work at the Museum of Natural History to run their affinity travel program, which was a pretty amazing uh, little boutique travel program that worked with Harvard scientists going around the world, small group travel. <laughs> and um, worked in the museum for about six, six years. Uh, became director of external affairs there. And then had distanced myself slowly from travel and sort of wanted to get back to travel. And I'd always looked at the Harvard Alumni Association travel program and thought it was really bad. And by a turn <laughs> of events, the whole team was sort of cleared out. And I made my case. And they hired me into the HA to run the affinity travel program. What year was that when you started? Um, let's see. So now I had 13 years ago, Okay. whenever that was. Mm -hmm. um, I can do that math. Yeah. <laughs> and. Uh, you know, I find I never know what year it is. You're always thinking about the next year and then the last year and the academic years. It's like, who knows what right. year it is, um, which is why I always think I'm five years younger than I am. So <laughs> that's what got me into alumni affairs. Mm. And I was in the HAA, and I was like, wow, this is really cool. And the, the, director at the executive director at the time was legend. Jack Reardon, yeah, Jack, he was yeah. there. Um, he, well, I mean, I got executive director because he retired after 26 years. Yeah, right. A lot. Also, you know, he started in athletics, too. He had a long career at, at Harvard in admissions, athletics, and alumni affairs. And how long have you been the executive director? Oh, this is my third year. Third year. So that would be in 2014, if my math was yeah. correct. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so it's 2017? Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. It is, Phil. <laughs> the, um, I, as we talk about the future, I always think it's important to look back and, and, and see the lens that you view the world through. So hearing your background is both very interesting, obviously. And, Hearing um, kind of how the lens you look at the world and now as we look to the future is important as a foundational element. Let's, um, let's start with something that you're most excited about, something that's going on in your shop right now that has a future feel to it that um, might be a sort of a point of pride for you that you'd like to share with the audience about kind of where the Harvard program will start with Philip, if we could, and jump to Paula. It's, you know, even though I worked in the AJ for 11 years before it, 10 years before I became executive director. Um, you know, when you're working for someone, you're always sort of doing what that person right. wants you to do, right? right? So suddenly it was mine, and I got to really sort of think about how do I want to redirect and rethink. And I would say, of all the work that we're doing, what excites me most is our focus on the volunteer and really how we can better activate and align with our alumni volunteers to, to really expand the network more broadly across the world. And um, we've done that. We have an extraordinarily large board, um, which I think we'll talk about in a little while. But that board was always managed tightly, right? Controlled, mm. tried, tried to be controlled. And we would always say, you know, there's a, there's a hotel in Harvard Square called the Charles Hotel where we do all of our banquets and events. And it's like, we would just bring them in for chicken at the Charles. And that's pretty much <laughs> what we did, right? Um, and we would bring good speakers and educate them about the university. But they were oftentimes working at odds with staff, right? They'd, they'd percolate with ideas. And these are our volunteers from clubs, classes, the graduate schools. I mean, you know, we have a huge right. volunteer network. And our board is 400 people that come back three times a year. Um, and so, we would just, a staff would just be, you know, we'd have these committees percolating ideas that there's no way we could support them, or, you know, it was just always at odds. So I would say I am most excited about our work that's aligning the work of the board, focusing the board on strategic opportunities, really focusing it on volunteer training and empowerment so that they have the skills they need out in the field to do the work, to do the engagement yeah. for it. I was going to ask the group to guess how big your board was. I don't think anybody would have guessed that number. <laughs> We have Anybody? 140 directors and 265 something like that committee members. Anybody have a board bigger than 400? <laughs> <laughs> Do you? No, no. I have a question. How many staff manage that board? Well, so part of what I've done in aligning the, the staff and the volunteers is all staff in my office work with the board. There's a dedicated staff of three that work with our volunteer leadership. Um, and then in my office, I have about 45 staff, and everybody works with alumni, with the volunteers and the committees and the board structure. We're going to come back to that later, so <laughs> get some more questions going for Philip. Paula, you're 
I, I have uh, two great future-oriented things. We'll let you do two. Okay. One is that um, I actually stepped down June 30th as head of the Alumni Association, and I'm still part-time. And you're going to um, hear from Sarah. And you're going to hear from Sarah Shute. So what I'm excited about in the future is seeing where Sarah takes everything and, that we have and moves it ahead into the future. So she can talk about the future probably even better than I can. But on the other hand, and I'm delighted that she has succeeded me, uh, more organizations need to think about succession and how to bring great leaders forward from within your organization. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you need to move it from, without, from the outside and bring somebody in, but we are not really doing what we need to do as a profession to think seriously and, and holistically about leadership and succession. So maybe we can talk about that a little yeah. bit more. The other exciting thing for the future is uh, we're soon going to launch a very um, creative, um, I'll brag about it, I think a very creative, unique uh, destination that's on our campus, along with a very, very robust and exciting new um, alumni um, outreach, user-generated digital experience. And this is Alumni Park Peer in Place, and it is a park of um, ideas and stories, uh, telling the stories of the graduates of the University of Wisconsin-Madison around themes, around values, and outcomes. It's very interdisciplinary. It's about areas of distinction. We talk about service and discovery and leadership and tradition and legacy and, and progress. And we have the voices of alumni in here. 50 museum exhibits uh, are out in the park. It will be a whole new platform for programming, communication, interaction, great partnerships with our colleagues on campus and uh, a, rant, a really new home for alumni to come back to in uh, what we call One Alumni Place. And that title's important to me about the name of our new um, uh, location for alumni, One Alumni. I see the future needing to be even more about one alumni body that's supporting the whole institution and working across because uh, it's the outcomes of the university and the outcomes in the lives our industry, our, our alumni make uh, live out in the world that's really such a testament to higher education. So we're very, very excited about this. We don't think there's anything like it in the, yeah, in the was, country. Yeah, ask the group, how many people have an alumni building or equivalent in their, on their campus? How about an alumni park? <laughs> an alumni place? <laughs> um, I'm, I'm going to not see any hands on this one other than one. Well, alumni and, and pier. Sarah and Kate. They have a pier out on the lake, which is just we're, amazing. We're Wisconsin, yes, that's the one I'm aware of. <laughs> Very so, cool. Yeah. Those are your two? Those are my two. Yeah, I like the succession I, planning. We, I, we used to tell our volunteer leaders all the time the best thing you can do is find your successor yes. in the role right. as a volunteer, let first alone job. as a professional. First yeah. job. Yeah, that's your first job, right? Yeah. yeah. Let's, let's we keep, need to practice what we tell our yeah, alumni good point. leaders that we want them to do. So. Let's stay on volunteers for a second and um, let me ask you this question. I think the volunteer roles of the future, as you think about volunteer management and how it plays out, a young alum, my experience has been that they look at these board roles that we traditionally have had more of as a sentence than as an honor. <laughs> um, and they don't want to come to campus three or four times a year or whatever number I suggested yesterday, which somebody told me I said zero. I still don't believe I said that. But um, in terms of how many board meetings should you have. But the role is going to change, I think. It's just inevitable and the type of uh, behavior and the activities they want to be involved in. But just think about this at a high level, 5, 10, 20 years from now, not board necessarily, just volunteers in general. How are they going to behave? What are they going to expect? Paula, we'll start with you. Well, I think that my worldview is that alumni are an integral part of the life of a university and I don't I think we do enough to bring them into that life of the university I think in the future uh, we have a lot of young people who uh, have great things to teach us we need to create new more uh, um, ad hoc quick topic specific ways that we invite our graduates, a small group, it can be 15 people, and they've got a project, and they're Skyping, and they're teleconferencing, and they're helping the staff figure out how to innovate mm. and change. We do not listen to our customers very mm -hmm. well, I don't think. And I think the more we could be interactive and use alumni 
for advice and counsel, uh, test ideas, beta test things, have them look at things before we send them out to 100,000 people. Quick things like that are very motivating. To be asked to do something for your university by the Alumni Association director or a dean or a department chair is a very great engagement opportunity. We need to think about how to take time to do that in really quick, quick ways. I think that we will also need to do more to continue to train our staffs to work with great skill and nimbleness with volunteers so yeah. that it, they can be comfortable uh, working with volunteers, knowing when to kind of graciously put the stop sign up and when to say, come on, pull them out and get their ideas. So we need to do a little bit more in that. Um, and I think being able through digital uh, engagement, such as we all are, do with Graduate, that ability to help connect people, help each other. To me, volunteerism is really about helping. Are you helping the university or helping another alum or an alum helping a student? That's all volunteering. Yeah. And so we get really hung up, I think, on real formal, rigid structures. Mm -hmm. And I think some of those occasionally are still needed. But that's just one small thing compared to many points of light, as George Bush used to say. A thousand points a of light. A thousand points of light. And we just need to get not afraid. Yeah. We shouldn't be afraid of our loves. We shouldn't be afraid to ask their opinion and their advice and their counsel we, we have more a, quickly and more frequently. I've heard several institutions refer to what you're describing as micro-volunteering opportunities. Mm -hmm. I just love the concept. Mm -hmm. just, I know what you mean. I don't, yeah, done in a day, another one I've heard. Ab done absolutely, yeah. Yep. Philip, same, yeah. same question. Well, I completely agree with Paula. I think um, you know, our business is so amorphous that we tend to try and put a lot of structure around right. it. Right. And <laughs> I think sometimes we focus way too much on the structure. And that is, I think, what we're finding our more recent graduates are sort of pushing back against. They don't want the structure. They want to be engaged. They want to do stuff. But they don't want commitment. They don't want you know, coming back to board meetings. Or So I envision a much less sort of structured environment in the future um, around volunteerism. And I think I mean, my thinking is more towards training people to be good volunteers and shortening their in really deep engagement within our structure and then setting them free. Mm -hmm. um, because without them, we can't do our work. I mean, we right. have 350,000 alumni. I, you know, exactly. it's like <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you, you, you need those boots on the ground yeah. out there. So right? it's really, I mean, it's about empowering that, that desire and that connection. And then what tools do they need, right? We're in the tool business. What tools do yeah. they need to do the connecting, to do the community organizing? to uh, connect back to the university and to each other. I, I do think it will be, would be facilitated if you have the ability to influence or encourage a more campus-wide or enterprise-wide value for the use of volunteers. Because you might not have all of those opportunities right within the Alumni Affairs right. Office. Right. Um, people really do want to be involved with students. And so how to partner and collaborate so that um, you know, all the different aspects of entities on the campus could all be working with you and you with them to create the, the mosaic of, of how, to, how to connect. Let me go back to Philip on the board issue. So you have <laughs> the, the 400 spots give you an opportunity to take a fairly large group and engage them. Mm -hmm. my, my suspicion would be is that there's a challenge in the what is the role of that group. You alluded to some of the mis- or, I don't, mm -hmm. you know, the, disalignment of those, what the board wants versus what the staff is doing, et cetera. But then if you were to reduce the size of the board, then you have less opportunities, but you have more strategic potential impact from that smaller group, but you've lost that other. You've been thinking about this a little bit, a little what, bit. what the next stage is. So <laughs> and you, you're in a, we're in Las Vegas here, right? It's what happens here stays here. So I, I heard it was like off the record, but on the record. On the record. Okay. <laughs> it's, consider this therapy. The cameras so are let running, Philip. Let it out. Let it out. Okay. Come on. We got 400 people here to help you. Yeah. Do I have any of my volunteers in the audience? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, you're right. I mean, it's, it's an incredible opportunity to bring all these people back to campus sure. and connect them to campus. And, you know, bringing alumni to campus is a huge piece of what we do. But a bigger piece is, you know, what we do out in the field. And um, so my thinking is more about the field. I mean, we have 
200 Harvard clubs around the world. We have 60 shared interest groups. You know, we got all our class structures, our graduate school structures. I mean, there are endless ways right. of creating community within this larger community. So I am starting to focus more on sort of regional strength. And I mean, we had a meeting last year in San Francisco where I said to my team, and this, Paul and I were sitting over there like cursing silos. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and you know, even in my team of 45 staff, I have silos, right? And then you just, it just silo, silo, silo all over the place. And Harvard is notorious for its silos. Um, but I, we were out in San Francisco and I said to my staff, I want to call in all of our known leaders of our known organizations to a meeting, right? So this is across clubs, shared interest groups, college classes, graduate school, councils, the whole thing. And um, I just want to get them in a room. And they're like, well, what are you going to do? I'm like, I want them in the room. I just want to talk to them. I want them to talk to each other. And I want to find out what are their challenges and what, yeah, are, you know, what right. they want to do. Mm -hmm. And so we did it. And everybody introduced themselves. We had about 25 people sitting around a table. And they all introduced themselves. And then I said, so how many of you just learned about an organization here in the Bay Area of alumni <laughs> that you didn't know about? And every single person raised their hand. <laughs> Right? Yeah. So that was my aha moment. I'm yeah. like, we have a huge opportunity here, right. right? We've got all of these volunteers doing the same kind of work, trying to organize people, trying to put events together, trying to do communications, trying to build excitement about Harvard, and they're all doing it alone. Right. Right? And if we could get that group together on a regular basis, which we're now doing and we're piloting it for to do across the world. Other but, cities, yeah. And then, you know, and you know, you gotta risk like you gotta resist like structure. Let's create regional councils, right? And my staff's like, no, let's just keep doing this. I'm like, right. good, you've, you've listened. Yeah. Right. That's <laughs> great. Resist, you talk about resist structure. Yeah. yeah. Talk resist. about silos. One of my favorite expressions I learned when we were working with UCLA was when they described their silos with quite passion. They said that we have silos of excellence. <laughs> <laughs> you know, another thought on the on the uh, <laughs> the power of the board and bringing Sorry, people Angel. together. <laughs> Um, <laughs> we all have silos of excellence. They just need to be more porous. Um, the, uh, one of our problems is people don't want to cycle off of our board. Right. They like coming back. Yeah. So we need a place for them to go. And if you have risen up to the organization as a club president or something and then ended up as a director on our board, you're not going to go back and work in the club, right? So, I mean, that's where I think this regional thing could also add a little bit of spice, you know, and there's something to be engaged with. So. Yeah, that's a, that's a very tricky yeah. issue. People start feeling ownership of whatever it is they're in charge yeah. of. So, Paul, Should I talk comments? about boards? Yeah. <laughs> How big was yours? Well, I was shocked at what you said yesterday, that there shouldn't be boards. <laughs> that's a whole different conversation. We <laughs> you said what? <laughs> he said. He's saying he didn't. No, I didn't did. say that. I said, how many times a year should a board be meeting? And I said zero. <laughs> he said zero. OK, all right. Well, when I started as um, president, um, we had 75. One of the first things I did working with the chair of the board was to um, move into a model of best practices around board and a board of a whole and cut the size way down and yeah. stop having representational board and then to get very serious about recruitment of who was going to be on the board of Pipeline directors. For volunteers. And this was a board that was, uh, had fiduciary responsibility as mm -hmm. well because at that point we were, well, we still are 501c3, but we were the separate alumni association. And not, one of the most satisfying uh, uh, parts of my 18 years um, has been the development of a board and learning and, and working together and having a partnership with this uh, board, especially what we call the exec committee, and gleaning knowledge, information, partnerships, therapy sessions with the chair of the board, the chair of the board giving me therapy sessions. I feel very proud of the quality yeah. of board um, interaction and leadership and partnership. And that really helped us achieve so much more as an association. And it added to our brand, it added to our reputation, it added to our influence, it added to our influence with schools and colleges. Thinking about you know, how to be very strategic in creating your own board orchestra that can work with you to move progress forward. And nothing helps more than to have a board member talk to another alum leader somewhere and say, you know, John, we really just appreciate so much what you've done. We want to recognize you, but it's time for you to 
let somebody else lead the New York City hmm. badger apples. That's a hypothetical apples. you threw out. Uh, <laughs> certainly, just a totally <laughs> hypothetical. But anyway, so I, I, I think there is a role in place for that, and whether they're councils or boards, um, I think more needs to be done to think about how to leverage influence for alumni relations and engagement through the, um, through the alums <laughs> themselves who have certain credentials that make them more influential within the academic campus yeah. setting or it, with the development office. To be, to be clear about what I said yesterday, the way I answered this question, <laughs> get off the hot seat here, because we found out later on that there was a board member in the room and I was like, oh my God. And one of the uh, clients brought their board chair with them. And um, <laughs> what I found in my consulting role though is that when we get called in, the expression I used yesterday was a good board should have their noses in, but their fingers out. Mm -hmm. And when we get brought in, we get brought in because the board's got their hands all over everything yeah. and it's driving the alumni leader crazy. Yeah. Um, so when you have a board like that and they meet four, six times a year, I say zero, right? But if the board could function at a strategic level, up at the top of that pyramid I showed yesterday, the vision, mission, at the high level priority, then I think the right number of meetings a year, two or three, probably right. I think the right number of board members is somewhere in the 10 to 20 range personally. JT Forbes at Indiana got his board down to eight people. Mm, yeah, and he talks kind of about it because you can't, he says, I want it to be eight people who are there, who are accountable to each other, who are strategic, and they can't hide and look at their cell phones during the meeting because I'm sitting with 50 people in the room. Mm. I get value out of those eight people and they get value out of being a part of that. So that's where I see us going, frankly, more in that category. Paul, I want to just ask you to, you're in that large school category. No, I think those, those areas need to be smaller. What's yeah. ironic is I see them getting, uh, whether their boards or advisory councils get smaller on the alumni relations side and on the development <laughs> or foundation side, the boards get bigger yeah, right. <laughs> because uh, our foundation, now we have a combined board and um, they had 45 and so they finally started cutting their board when we merged. So it's interesting, here you are going one to many, but you get a smaller, more strategic yeah, group to right. think through it. And then uh, the development side can often. But I think it's something we're gonna see consistently yeah, in yeah. the future coming up for alumni leaders to think about, whether you're K-12, um, large, public, small, or anything, even in uh, nonprofits that are in the room that have boards, these are issues that you're gonna be facing. Well, you know, with your I, I, mean, I think too, it's, it's how you define board, right? I mean, right. certain schools have very, I mean, you know, independent organizations need fiduciary boards, right? Right. Who are like doing That's the work point. of a traditional board. My board is an engagement and sort of volunteer board. I mean, they're, they're there to engage. It's, it's one of our largest engagement mechanisms. Mm -hmm. So it's very different. And I do have an executive committee that helps guide, but I'm also I'm like, I'm in charge. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. That was never a question. <laughs> And, you know, the, the saying that a good board has their noses in, fingers out is to help you think about the role a board plays. But another good saying that I use with uh, clients often is you get the board you deserve. So if you manage it like you talked about and you can draw the line, you get yeah. a great board and you deserve that. You've got if, if you don't and they get up in your business, you deserve that. You've got to let, them, let it happen. Now, sometimes you inherit that from previous structures and it's your job to move it and fix it. But um, that's one of the challenges. I'm, gonna, I'm just wary of the time here. I want to make sure we have some time oh, for questions. Oh, we're yeah, we're totally going to go fast. <laughs> um, I'm going to skip a couple here and get to um, uh, the programmatic question we talked about, about these structures of alumni communities, structure, structure, structure. We have class. We have, you know, based on their class year, we have uh, regional and zip code and, and affinity groups. Do these structures exist in the future when you think about the programmatic work that you do, whether it be communications, events, et cetera? Or there, is there something else that's coming behind it that you think is going to be even more important? I think, Paula, you were up for this question, so we'll go to you first. Well, well Philip Ponders. In, in, you mentioned several, I mean, I think we're all already working with other kinds of ways of organizing alumni through identity, mm -hmm. through, um, I think, the whole direction. I think we're just starting to scratch the surface on um, uh, the whole industry affiliation, professional networking, not so much through the school or college connection, but the industries that are out there, I think there's a great potential and we're just going to see that mushroom in terms of industries and corporation, alumni groups within corporations and creating these opportunities where people are that mutual value piece. Yeah, right. I mean, groups really shouldn't probably exist unless there's some mutual value, either amongst themselves as alumni, right. or there's mutual value 
from them amongst themselves and back to the institution and its right. and its priorities. So, and I think um, I think the big thing this has to we have to figure out is if you let how do we how would we have enough trusted, trained, diverse um, alumni volunteers that are out and about around the world that they, you know, if things bubble up and organically people want to self-organize, mm -hmm. let them run and do it. You just, you just need to kind of want to know what's happening, yeah, right? Yeah. And we always have to control everything. I mean, it's just crazy. We, we, we can't control it all. We need to do whatever we can to foster it, make it known that that's okay. Don't hide it. Tell us. We're not going to stomp down on you and right. say, stop, the Gestapo's in here to say you can't be a badger or something or other. So we need to have some mindset changes around self-organization, but then also feel like um, we don't have to necessarily provide, we have to be clear about what, how much resource Support, we put yeah. into it. Yeah. So, so that's, that's where I say, I, I'm, I don't yet know that we have real deep digital group engagements, to be honest. I think we're just really starting to kind of try to see if that happens. And I think that's one reason we invested in Graduate, was to yeah. see whether that would f help us uh, be a tool that would help us do that. There's no magic bullet. Don't yeah. Uh, my guess is that half the room embraced what you said and said, love to let them run free. And the other half was like, oh, I need to control that. Well, what advice would you give the uh, <laughs> control freak? Well, <laughs> have a drink. Have a drink. Yeah, have a drink. <laughs> Mine would be to pilot and try it. Just give it, give it a shot. Try some, why one thing out. See what I, happens. I think you don't have to control it. Uh, I think you can trust and let it go. I think there are people you know in certain topics or content, I mean, is the group somewhere under the umbrella of the values mm -hmm. and principles and mission That's the key. of the organization? I am, you know, very much these days, I think really the only way to hold everything together is to speak through your, and look at things through the eyes of your values, of your institution, of your organization. Does it fit within that? If it doesn't, then you have a conversation. You know, this, this is what we stand for. We need to come back to mission. And we need to come back to values and principles yeah. and lead and, and direct from that. And that, there, I think we're going to talk about some other things later. We are. That's coming I up next. I think that's a really <laughs> yeah. critical future direction that we need to hang on to seriously and fully and completely. Philip, you're, you're, let's go back to the question on the structured piece, and then we're going to jump into our last question, and we'll open it up. So I, comp again, completely agree with Paula. Um, well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and I think you have to think about, I mean, going to sort of more of the control question, because this is what it all comes down yeah, to. Yeah, yeah. Um, you have to think about different sort of tiers of control, and where does it matter? You know, and, and I made that flip comment earlier, like, I'm in charge with my board, but that's where I have a lot of, I, I want a lot of control, right? Because right. they're sort of the, the peak of this volunteer infrastructure. Right? And they're the top of that. And they're, they're leading the way for the other volunteers in our volunteer network. And I think, you know, going back to my San Francisco story, I mean, that to me shows that we need to figure out how to create the framework for, for this activity to happen um, and pro provide the tools where they can find each other and they can do the connecting and sort of empower that and, and celebrate it. But at the same time, you do need a certain level of structure because there is messaging from the university we want to get out into the field, right? Right. There are, you know, there are a lot of components that we need to have ways to plug into. So I was thinking about all of our communities as our distribution networks. You need some structure mm. around that distribution network. But at the same time, if recent graduates who have moved to the Bay Area want to create their own group because they feel like the club's too fuddy-duddy and there's nothing else for them, you know, like, hallelujah, do it. But do it slightly attached to the club, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. But yeah. then you get the control issues of our volunteers. So we're like, what do you I, do? I you know? Know. <laughs> and and sort of to the sort of future of these communities, and then we go to the next question, many of our bigger, stronger clubs are starting to question the dues proposition. And I like applaud that hugely, yeah. because yeah. I think they spend half of their energies collecting dues. 
right, and Amen. doing campaigns. Amen, brother. <laughs> and it's like every alum in that area should feel like they're part. And we have some clubs that are like that. If yeah. you're an alum, you know, you're in, in Finland, you're a member of the Harvard Club of Finland, and you're welcome to everything. And I think, you know, so I, I, we're starting to see a, a slow sort of decay of these kinds of old structures just happen, and then an organic growth of, of more organizing. We, I showed a slide yesterday, Philip, of um, uh, it was an institution that I use as an example, but it was basically an amalgamation of any dues program. Slope goes like this when you do it by age. The older you are, the more likely you are. The younger you are, the less likely you are. And that's what's going on. Well, happening. what's the value proposition? Right? Exactly. That's what we talked about yesterday. Let's go to this um, one. We're going to open it up to the audience, but I'm going to go broad and sort of take it out of the day to day and, and think about the role of an alumni leader in the current political climate. <laughs> because we could. Lots of things can happen Flat on the college. Flat jackets are a really good thing to have. <laughs> Flat jackets. <laughs> um, but here, as an example, you have a president of a university. I won't name specifically, but they have gone out and made a stance on you an issue. on DACA, for instance? Yeah, DACA or uh, the immigration things that came out last fall. And, and when a president goes out and says something like that, the ripple that it creates. All the lights light up on the old phone. Exactly, yeah. right. It's like the, the image I get is like somebody's phone is burning off the hook. Because you're going to have some that are going to be like, yes. But you're going to have another group that are going to go, what the heck's he or she doing getting involved in that discussion? And then the calls start coming in to your offices, right? The alumni are going to be the ones responding to it. So what's the role of the alumni leader in managing in the climate where we can see the, you know, I said it's not day to day, but it seems like it's day to day now in our current administration here in the United States anyway. Um, Paula, we'll start with you, because I know this is a passion point for you, and we'll let <laughs> Philip jump in. Well, it, it is a passion point. It's a difficult point, yeah. though, too. Um, I, I think, first of all, we all have to make sure we each understand um, and stay in the loop of internal communication on, so that we get heads up about the chancellor's going to put out this statement or that statement. You know, I'm sure you all have that kind of communication uh, that is um, providing uh, leaders around the campus with, with that. So you've got to have that. You've got to know what's going on. Um, I, over the years, uh, when, when people have disagreed with something the campus has done or a faculty member has said, you know, we really do try to respond to every single one of those. Um, um, I empower other staff to do it. We think about what we want to say. Our mantra has been to, it tells me they have some heartbeat for the university. Mm -hmm. Now, there are times in the last couple of years where I'm not sure that I feel like they really have a heartbeat for the university. They have become caught up in such an extremely, um, such an extreme position politically for themselves, or they're so issues, single issue oriented that their response is probably more political action than mm. I care about the university. Yeah, right, right. And I, so th I have really seen that change. Um, you know, it would always be university first, but I don't, you know, and then you have that creative tension and you get alumni feedback and you send it into the chancellor or wherever. And that's kind of a great, that should be the dynamic that mm -hmm. exists. But what is occurring these days is such a attack on higher education among certain mm -hmm. quarters that um, I, I will listen to that for a while, but then I'm gonna bring them back to, well, this is what this university was founded on. These are what our values are. That is a very big, broad roof. You graduated from here. Think about this in the context of, you know, education and learning. And I think that the rub is for me right now that if we don't, if we don't have presidents and chancellors, if at times we as alumni directors, the heads of advancement, if we don't stand up and speak out about some of these things, we're not fulfilling our mission as educational leaders. Some of these things really attack the core values mm -hmm. and purpose and mission mm -hmm. of what education's about. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I, you know, I can't stand by and just let that happen to be safe. And I said to Daniel, at the last talk I gave the joint board of the Foundation and Alumni Association in, um, in June, I was really talking about leadership from the board of directors and from the senior staff and the chancellor was in the room, and I said, 
we have to have, obviously, a brain, but we have to have heart and we have to have courage. And if we don't start leading with more courage and heart and without so much cowardness and being afraid, we gotta stand up to bullies. I mean, that's essentially what some of the really loud noise is. It's absolutely bully behavior. And this is our industry. This is our field. It's the future of our children and our kids and our world. We can't stand, back. we can't sit back. We gotta, we gotta talk. <laughs> we Love it. So the Wizard of Oz. The Wizard of Oz. I love it, it Paul. I can feel it. I'm getting emotional hearing it. That's great. Philip, follow that. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Do you agree with Paul on that statement? I'm sorry. Not at all. <laughs> I'm sorry. Come on, Toto. Uh, amen, sister. That's what I say. Um, that was great. Well done. I don't have a whole lot to add to that. I think values are critical. And, you know, being at Harvard, we are just in the crosshairs all the time, right? And I will say, you know, this loss of the, you know, we're being sued about bias against Asians in our admissions process. Um, we're being targeted by um, anti-affirmative action people constantly. Um, but I will say that we have been able to turn that to talking about this core value, which is really truly core to Harvard right now, of diverse perspectives in the learning community and mm -hmm. how important that is. Mm -hmm. And we're able, and the alumni get it. I mean, we, we have an elected board, a governing board of the university. We have two governing boards of the university. One's fully elected by alumni of alumni. And two years ago, we had a petition, actually, yeah, two years ago, we had a petition slate that was put together by Ron Hans, who's fiercely anti-affirmative um, action. Mm. And so that raised up a huge amount of discussion about the importance of a diverse learning environment. And the alumni like stood up and, and like made sure that the right thing was done around that. Um, and so we have to listen to all these people. We finally listen to the half of 1% who are the loudest all the time complaining about everything. Mm -hmm. But I always say, when people say, like, why, do, why, why do schools have alumni relations? I'm like, alumni keep a university honest. I mean, alumni are, in fact, the owners of these institutions mm -hmm. in my mind. Mm -hmm. And so if a president or a chancellor comes out and says something that really ticks somebody off, I'm like, you know what? Speak up. If you don't agree with this, make sure your voice is heard. I'm not going to say it to the president's office, but I would be more than happy to pass your message through mm. so that the people are hearing. I mean, it's, you know, schools, higher ed in particular, are just really messy organizations, right? You've got so many stakeholders. You've got faculty, you've got students, you've got alumni. And it's about sort of bringing all these together and ensuring that you continue to move forward. Um, and I think alumni play a huge, huge role in that. Yeah. And it's, so it's important. And we got to yeah. listen to it. I mean, it's what we do. And, but I, I, I applaud. I mean, the values, absolutely. And, yeah. and in, if this nation and this world needs anything right now, it's what we do as institutions of higher learning. And what we stand for and what our position is in the world is critical. And it's a time where institutions are just being challenged across the board. So I agree, Paula. We've got to fight. I, I know you've got to wrap up, but can let me make one more comment. Go, yeah. I do feel at times discouraged as a chief alumni officer, as a member of the Big Ten, as part of CAAE, that, that somehow we, I don't think we have as a coalition of colleges and universities, at least in the United States, we haven't somehow pulled the whole millions of people who I do mm. believe have a great deal of love and respect mm. and value the education they received at our schools. We ought to be staging a big march on Washington. I mean, where are our alum, what, what inhibits us from making that a cause that we can't all unite around? I, I'm on the case board of trustees and I'm talking about that at times with the trustees. It's like, wow, where, you know, where are the feet? Where's yeah, the advocacy? Exactly. So anyway. If sorry. I could thank you both very much for all that. We're going to open it up. If I could pull a chair down here right now to add to this conversation, I would have uh, Cindy from UVA come join us who just experienced on their campus one of the, you know, 
perfect examples of these kind of things. Not mm -hmm. a UVA alumni related thing, but it happened on their campus. Cindy, I don't know where you are in the room, but I'm sure that was an issue for the alumni body and you spent time, I would think, dealing with it. So um, that happens. It, it's becoming more frequent, unfortunately, that we're seeing. Yeah. Um, let's open it up. Uh, there are microphones in your aisle. If you have a good booming coach voice, you don't need to use it, just let it fly. But uh, turn the house lights up a little bit so we can see we have one over here. Go ahead. You got a good voice, man. Bring it. Yeah, uh, <laughs> you can hear me way back in Wisconsin. Um, <laughs> I'm Seth Lynch from the Medical College of Wisconsin, and so I represent the professional school yeah. piece of it. Um, we're growing and changing, and so we've always just been a medical alumni association. Eventually, my role will be the overarching and cover pharmacy, grad school, all the other. So I'm interested to hear your perspective. I know it won't represent more of the, what we would have in my old life called central or main campus. Right. To pick on one of you, or you, one of you ready? I'll, I'll start. Philip, go ahead. <laughs> Since you're here on the medical school campus, um, <laughs> it ain't easy. <laughs> but like everything we do, it's about persuasion, collaboration, and influence, right? Um, and I think, like everything we do, what's the value proposition, right? So, what can you provide to the larger university community? And that will benefit them in their work, and what can they provide for you? Um, at Harvard, you know, I run the Harvard Alumni Association, which represents all alumni across the university, and we are also home to the College Alumni Association. Each of our graduate professional schools has its own alumni office, an alumni association. I have absolutely no control over those. They report up through their, to their deans. Um, so we, just sort of, we get together monthly and we have meetings and sort of talk about, and we, we try and do programming together. And I try and, we try and do stuff to showcase some of the incredible research that's happening over here on the Longwood campus that's really gonna interest the business school graduates or the college graduates. And try and do, and as we do big flagship university things, we encourage our graduate professional schools to do events around those flagship university-wide things, to sort of bring their audiences in. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, it's just, it's, it's an incremental, when I started the HA, we had very bad, um, relations, I think, with the schools. Many of them were very independent, didn't see value in working with us, and just over the years, it's like you build the relationships. It's alumni relations work within your own school. Yeah, it's like an internal version of yeah. it. It's, it's starting small, it's piloting, it's building those one-on-one -on -one relationships. Paul, any, you guys had some success in this recently, I think. Well, well we've, I, I, what I, Sarah has done great work in this, but um, uh, Phil alluded to it in terms of looking for other kinds of audiences that would value you as the general alumni director, you have access to a broad audience that I believe would have great interest in uh, some of the health and research and pharmacy right. issues that your faculty could bring. So, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of benefit in many ways with these programs that are maybe more based in schools or colleges, but those are, top, once again, you're, you're looking from the outside in, various topics in, around health and healthcare are extremely hot issues and people want to go hear what their university or their, their college has to say. So I think that's one of the main places to look for, for it is how to, how to come together for programming and content. That could, that could be a whole other uh, topic. Hand up in the back there, sir. Stand up and... Hi, how are you guys doing? Good. Uh, I'm from a K-12 school in Baltimore, Maryland, and uh, you've all talked about training volunteers. I was hoping you could, could share some success stories of training volunteers and maybe some specific tactics you've used over the years to help develop volunteers throughout. Paula. Well, um, a couple of quick, quick things. Um, you know, what ways in, in which what ways do you want to use your volunteers? What's the job description you need to write for volunteers? 
What are your expectations of them? What can they expect from you? So you want to get, like you said, not, this isn't trying to be controlling. This is actually just trying to set up a healthy um, uh, compact between the volunteer and you, trying to engage them. Um, I think you, it's good to um, start with uh, some volunteers or people that you already know who are interested in volunteering in a particular project. Um, talk to them, say, who else do you think would be good with this? Um, having some other um, known volunteer, um, volunteer members of the community ask some other volunteers helps, helps you build a good core of them. Um, uh, things like uh, the expectations, the job descriptions, the toolbox kind of stuff. You know, uh, I've, you know, you got name tags, you got maybe some swag. Um, but they also clearly know kind of what is it that I'm supposed to come and do? Right. When do I arrive? How can I be helpful? I mean, you know, it gets kind of specific because they're, they're busy, you know, I'm going to come once a week for an hour and this is what I can expect and this is how I make a difference and these are the specific things I do as a volunteer. The worst thing is if you get too nebulous and kind of, well, just show up and we'll give you something to do. That's terrible all the way around. And so boil it down as if you were hiring a, 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 a student to come help with you, and, but you've got a volunteer. So those are just some of the starting blocks. Happy to talk more afterwards on that. Philip, anything? Yeah, I, no, I, just to reinforce, I mean, I think role clarity, expectation setting, and then succession so that they understand it's time limited engagement with you in, in a certain capacity. Mm -hmm. And you know the rest is uh, yeah. Any, anybody in the room do a large gathering uh, where they bring them together in a leadership like summit of their volunteers and train them all at once in the various roles. Any school doing something like that? Leadership summit. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen a lot do. of schools do a version of that. That's a, a good tactic. It could be costly, but it's a huge impact. K through 12, they, they, they may be, I don't know what school it is, but if your population is geographically similar, that can make it easier for them to get together in one location. If they're spread out, it could be harder. But we have time for one more question. Over here, David, you pick whoever it is and give them a microphone. Yes, gentlemen. Yes, good morning. Um, my name is Walter Raleigh Higgs III, and um, I, am, I serve as the Director for Development and Fundraising Initiatives for my local alumni association, Morehouse College. Uh, Morehouse College is in Atlanta, Georgia, but we have an alumni association here in the greater Boston area. Um, my question is not so much so about our local alumni association, but more so a, a question that just kind of popped up in my head with the ongoing growing trend of online and online alums um, mm -hmm. who want to be involved um, in the overall community um, of the school. What have your experiences been um, as it relates to um, alumni participation and a lot of, uh, I can just speak from a graduate school level of my graduate school definitely, you know, have alums who want to be a part of the greater community, but they were not traditional, but they were online, um, but still wanted to play an integral role. How have your experience or what advices have you seen or can you give as it relates to alumni involvement for those who were on online or a part of the online communities for your institutions? Philip, you look ready. I'm ready. <laughs> I'm just gonna, I'm gonna put it out there. Um, so we have definitions of alumni that require, that there are sort of three levels. One is if you're degree holding, you're a full alum. The second is an associate member, but that requires nine weeks of residency um, on the campus in some capacity. So that does cover a bunch of executive education courses. It does not cover online learning. If I had to accommodate online learning through HarvardX, I would probably have about 30 million alumni. Um, and so being from Harvard, I have an elitist view of this. <laughs> wow, he just Could put it right out there. That out of the, uh, <laughs> the transcript. Um, that, you know, I just, we, we can't accommodate them. I mean, I think there's, there's some interest potentially, Harvard X, you know, as part of edX, it's its own in, independent, um, though affiliated learning opportunity. And I think they have an interest in 
building sort of a communications cohort um, out of their users, um, but that just would not fall within the realm of yeah. the alumni How about we have some of that at Wisconsin, I'm assuming. Right? Was, was that the type of online connection you were, they, you, they studied and became affiliated through Morehouse, through the online? Oh, no, no, this is not with Morehouse. Morehouse, um, my, my album, my undergraduate al al alma mater um, definitely is not doing and have not done the online yet. Um, we're, we're not, they're not going to do it, but I'm speaking more so from my um, graduate, uh, graduate perspective. They, uh, my graduate school actually launched um, an online, um, a online program, um, Masters of Social Work. So you could start from the beginning oh. and get a degree, a graduate yes. degree, without yeah. ever setting foot on campus. Right, I got but, you. but they did actually come back. They completed only. all the courses. They did it online, got but it. they actually came and completed classes, and they actually came back and participated in the commencement exercises. Yeah, we, we would have that, too. We would just try to fold them into, because um, they have a degree from our institution. Um, they go through commencement. We would, um, uh, if they are in our databases having received a, a degree from UW, then we will start trying to interact with them through all the different kind of mechanisms we do. Now, whether that's at this point really um, not as effective, and maybe we ought to look at that slice of, of audience, but then I think we'd have a hard time spending a lot of time and energy on that, in all honesty, because we have such a big population yeah. of alums who've actually been on campus. So they're just, they're, you just reach resource limitations. Yeah, it's, a, and, it's, it's probably a topic for a panel, for an yeah. entire discussion, yeah. I mean, because there are many schools thing. that are doing it. Yeah. Uh, just to be clear, though, Harvard does not grant any online degrees. Right. We, we did a project for the University of Phoenix at the extreme side of this. A million alumni, 800,000 of them never set foot on one of their on-ground, I think they call it. We have an on-ground alumni base and then an online alumni base. So they, were, they had a new president who arrived, and they said, look, I got a million alumni. I don't need to raise money from them. We have a different business model. But how can I use them to help with recruiting students, mentoring students, providing internships, and hiring our graduates? So they brought us in in a consultancy way to help them think about how to connect with that online audience. And I tell you, it's not easy. It's a very, a lot of those programs are set up as a very transactional thing. Even their right. commercials, the way they position themselves is move ahead in your career, you get your degree and you can get this result. It's not a relationship with, the, it's not what we've talked about here or what Harvard especially, especially right. has experienced in that residential way. But it's a huge challenge. And, and I think we have to attempt other ways other than our traditional methods. I think some of that, on, that work that we can do is probably digital and online. They can stay involved with alma mater right. in a different way. We just, it's, it's so new in our industry. Yeah. I'm getting a from the, uh, from the boss behind. So we are done. Uh, thank you for the time. I'm sure we could have kept going much longer. Thank you. Let me thank Paula and Philip. Wonderful as we thought you would be. Thank you. I told them, I said, as we were preparing, I said, don't write down your answers, don't rehearse, just come and talk from the heart, and you both did it, so thank you very much. I give You're you my... Brilliant. Well. And if I can add a special thanks to Chris for sharing that, Paul and Philip, give them a big round of applause again.